So um, I want to welcome everybody to this one hour presentation on the Regent Honey Eater, where we're going to be sharing information on this critically endangered bird and talking about practical conservation management. My name is Jackie Gregg. I'm a communications officer for Local Land Services, and I'm going to be your host for today. To start our webinar, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we're working on. For me, this is Wiradjuri country, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Before we get started, I'll run through some quick housekeeping for us. On the right hand side of your screen up the top, you're going to see the chat function and that allows you to actively participate in today's webinar. We really do encourage you to pop questions in there as we're going through and we'll try and answer them as we go. If you wouldn't mind keeping yourself muted um, as we're presenting, just to cut out background noise. If you've got a question, because there aren't a lot of us, um, uh, up the top, um, there's a little reactions button. You can just put your little hand up and we'll um, call on you, unmute yourself and ask your question. We really want this to be interactive and for you to get as much out of today's presentation as you can. Um, also to let you know that we are recording today's presentation just so that you're aware of that. Um, and if you do, um, if you would like to see live captions as we're presenting, up the top there's three little buttons. You can click on that and you'll be able to turn on um, live captions so that you'll be able to read what we're saying also. Now to get us started, I'd like to welcome Libby McIntyre, who is a land services officer for local land services. And she's been working on the reaching out to the Regent Honey Eater project, I think since 2008. Is that correct, Libby? Uh, not quite that long, not quite mm -hmm. that long, but um, but it's certainly a um, oh, it, sorry, it, about the last 18 years, yeah. about 18. 2018 is what I should yes. have said. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right, 2000, I was thinking, gee, where was I in 2008, but <laughs> that wasn't working on the region. Um, so yes, that's what I'll be doing, so it's it's been a fascinating journey for me, learning about this gorgeous threatened, threatened species. Um, so what I'd like to um, ask our few participants, we've just got a couple of pre-webinar questions that we'd like to be able to ask. So um, if you could go to your chat function, um, there are four questions that I'm going to ask and I will ask the question and if you would be able to um, put in the chat up the top, um, just pre, that's all you need to do, P-R-E, and then I'll ask you the first question and I'd like you to be able to just, um, the, the parameters that you have are one, I strongly disagree, two, disagree, three, I'm neutral, four, agree, or five, strongly agree. And if you could just write down, um, put one dot and that'll be the first question that I ask. And then after that, just say uh, one, two, three, four, or five. Um, does that, hopefully that makes sense. So the first question is, how confident are you of being able to identify the Regent honey eater, either by its call uh, or feeding habitat and its markings? If you could just pop that into the chat, that would be fantastic, everyone. Okay, hopefully everyone's been able to do that. Um, question number two, with the same parameters, is how confident are you in understanding the threats that are causing the decline in the numbers of Regent honey eater populations, not just in the Central West, but across New South Wales? So you just put down number two, question number two, and then after that, either one, two, three, four, or five. Question number three, and if you um, get a bit lost, I can re-ask these or I can send this to you um, after the webinar. <clears throat> are you confident in understanding what management actions are achievable to help slow the decline in regent honey eaters, regent honey eater numbers? Again, the same parameters.
And the fourth question, number four, <clears throat> will you look at making any changes if you're on farm to your farm management with the knowledge you will receive today? Now, I know some of you aren't on farm, but perhaps you might be able to speak to, to neighbours or other people that are farmers and might be happy to provide them with some extra information about the Regent Honey Eater. And again, the same parameters, one to five. Okay, well, I think that's, um, I'll leave that with you. And I'm going to hand over to David Kellett now, who's the project manager for the Regent Honey Eater with Local Land Services. David's uh, based in Grenfell, and he's got, he's going, he's going to give a brief presentation about the work that's been achieved by um, Local Land Services in Dubbo. So over to you, Dave. Uh, thanks, Lib. Um, I'll just share my screen. And hopefully this presentation will load up. Hopefully everyone can see that. <clears throat> um, firstly, I'd, um, I'd just like to apologise. I've got a bit of a, a cold at the moment, so I do apologise if you hear me snip or if I cough through my very short presentation. And um, I have only been working on this project now for nearly four months, so just new to it. So just a quick run through. Um, reaching out to the, the region Honey Eater is a project being delivered by Central West Local Land Services that is part of a nationwide effort aiming to stabilise or improve the trajectory of the Regent Honey Eater by 2023. The Regent Honey Eater is critically endangered and had previously oc occupied much of the Central West region. However, its range has declined significantly. The Central West Local Land Service Services region contains some important habitat for the region honey eater, and it has been spotted a few in a, at a few locations within the Central West region. Uh, and it's important for us that we preserve key habitat areas so that passing birds can rest, drink, forage and breed while they're here. Um, some outlines of the project activities that we've uh, been conducting over uh, the last four years. Uh, we had to establish a data set of the extent of the region honey eater occupancy in the Central West LLS region, and we undertake 50 surveys in priority foraging habitat, which is conducted by BirdLife Australia. Um, we had to develop a priority site map model and actions to enhance the quality and the extent of the Regent Honey Eater breeding and foraging habitat here in the Central West region. Native vegetation enhancement and restoration activities on private and public land, such as sustainable grazing management, pest animal and weed control. Um, and increase the knowledge of identification, ecology and habitat requirements of the Regent Honey Eater through attendance at volunteer surveying events, field days, workshops and webinars like this one. Um, in 2018, we, um, we started some incentive funding for private landholders in priority areas um, and that has been available for activities such as stock proof fencing, alternative watering points where we've fenced um, either creek lines or dams, weed and pest animal control, and this also covers public land as well as TSRs. Supplementary plantings of overstory and understory, site preparation, planting and maintenance. Some of our major achievements over the, the four years um, are listed here. So the total project area of just under a thousand hectares of habitat has either been um, protected or enhanced. Um, 
total total area including some um, TSRs and, and public land with pest control measures just under 1600 hectares. Um, uh, and we run obviously surveys and, and different workshops and um, and webinars. So that um, that sort of wraps me up. I trying to give Mick plenty of time for for his presentation. So I'm going to hand you over to BirdLife Australia's New South Wales Woodland Bird Program Manager, Mick Roderick. Over to you, Mick. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, Libby. Um, first of all, um, Jackie, <laughs> I'm unable to share at the moment. It's that option is greyed out for me. Oh, so, I apologise. That's okay. Um, so as David mentioned, I'm the New South Wales Woodland Bird Program Manager at BirdLife Australia. Uh, BirdLife have a number of programs, um, things like shorebirds and seabirds and woodland birds. Uh, woodland birds are, are one of the guilds of birds in Australia that are highly threatened. And one of the most threatened of our woodland birds is the Regent Honey Eater, and that's what I'll be talking about today. So I'll just bring up my talk. Turn the volume on. Okay, so is that, can everybody see that? I can't see people at the moment. If somebody could just let me know. Yes, yeah, we can see it. Yep. All right, great. That's great. And sorry, just before you go on, um, Mick, Rosemary's just asked a question uh, for David. Which areas of the Central West were the five potential sites in? Do we want to answer that now or come back to that at the end? Um, I think we might come back to that at the end, Dave, yeah. do you think? Yeah, thank you. If we can do that, that'll be great. Perfect. My apologies, Mick. That's OK. Um, just letting you know that all I can see on my screen is my talk, so I can't see any of the chat. Um, if people have questions, uh, maybe it's more efficient to do it at the end. Um, yeah, because I can't see anything that's coming up. OK, so. First of all, I just want to talk about the concept of temperate woodlands uh, as opposed to forests and, and other vegetation types. So what because we talk about woodland birds and our woodlands and our woodland birds are a very diverse group of birds and, and the habitat itself is an extremely diverse habitat type. Um, many of what we call um, woodland birds, that is the only habitat they use. We call them obligate woodland birds, things like black chin, honey eater, uh, flame robins, turquoise parrots, they don't use any other habitat type. Um, so it's important to get that concept of, of woodlands clear. And what we can see there is a beautiful um, functioning temperate woodland, nice fallen timber and spreading crowns. There's a lot of this sort of habitat left, mostly along the Great Dividing Range. And if you look at an aerial photo, you can see that, you know, there is quite a bit of forest left along the East Coast, but most of it is this sort of stuff. It's not actually suitable for for woodland birds and once again there's there's a nice photo of a of a beautiful temperate woodland and people will notice the mistletoe there and i'll come back to the mistletoe because it's a very important part uh, of our temperate woodlands but when we think about uh what has happened with our temperate woodlands uh that map there is is quite telling uh particularly in new south wales and on on the western slopes that red actually shows areas that were once woodlands uh, or, or, or wooded areas that have now been cleared. Um, you can kind of see along the, the coastal fringe, that's where most of the re remaining forests are. So we're in a situation now where we've lost about 85% of our temperate woodlands. And of that 15% that's left, most of that 15% is highly fragmented. So it doesn't actually serve as habitat uh, for woodland birds because it's really just habitat for, for edge specialists such as noisy miners. So when we talk about threatened woodland birds, uh, the, the most threatened are the Regent Honey Eater and the Swift Parrot. Uh, they are, I guess, the, the flagship species for, for a number of birds that are recognised as threatened or declining. Both of these birds uh, are, are nationally uh, listed as, as critically endangered. Uh, there's a nice nice photo of a, of a male Regent Honey Eater in, in the Cape Eddy Valley. Um, beautiful bird. Uh, so yeah, so they are a, a honey eater, so they, they specialise in eating nectar. 
uh, and particularly the nectar of, of, of gum trees. They were once called the uh, flying coachman or warty faced honey eater, but I, I reckon we'd struggle to get a re recovery program going for the warty faced honey eater. So it's good that they, they renamed it the, the beautiful Regent honey eater. So as I mentioned, these birds specialize in feeding on, on eucalypts and similarly to koalas, uh, they have their favorites. So in the central west region, uh, their favorites would be the mugger ironbark, uh, white box and yellow box. They're, they're the key eucalypts. Occasionally they'll use stringy barks and other things like that, but also mistletoes are, are very important as well. Uh, so just trying to, to delineate the sorts of, of habitat uh, that they use. In the central west, the, there's two vegetation types um, that Regent honey is preferentially use. Uh, one of those is the box ironbark woodlands, and there's a, a photo there showing some mugger ironbarks uh, with, with mistletoe. Um, so mugger ironbark, I guess, overall, you know, I, I kind of think, oh, you know, do they like spotted gun the most or, or mugger or yellow box? I think mugger ironbark almost wins out. It's it's such a special tree. Uh, when it flowers, it flowers for a long time and it provides an incredible amount of, of nectar. Um, they're also great habitat trees for, for other birds and, and animals as well. Uh, and in that environment, we get uh, the box mistletoe, Amium and Michelei. That's the that's the key mistletoe species we get in the box ironbark forests. Uh, and yes, yeah, so the mistletoe itself isn't just a, a food source for regent honey. It is when it flowers. A number of other birds will also use uh, box mistletoe. And there's some examples there of photographs I've taken of things like musk lorikeets, fryer birds, and there's a brown-headed honey eater hiding away, fitting on the, the blossom in the box mistletoe in, in that image. Uh, the other habitat type is the grassy white box uh, woodlands. And as the name suggests, the white box eucalyptus albans is the, the dominant tree type in, in that environment. And it's a it's also a tree that uh, regent honey eaters very much like to feed on uh, when it's flowering. Yeah, you know, white box uh, makes great honey and yeah, so, the nectar feeding birds flock to the white box when, it, when it's flowering. Flowers at different times of the year in different landscapes, but mostly it's a it's an autumn winter flowering tree. Whereas the yellow box, again, another uh, great honey producing tree, uh, flowers more in late winter, early spring. Uh, so it's an important tree for uh, breeding of, of regent honey eaters. And often you'll, you'll find yellow box uh, along watercourses and regent honey eaters are often attracted to to watercourses when they're breeding. And along, uh, literally, if you've got yellow box sort of out on the the, the, um, the, the banks of the river, so right along the banks are the, the, the river she oaks, the um, Casuarina Cunningham Yana. So these, this is also a very important habitat type. So not only do you have the yellow box um, sitting further away from the, the stream, but along the stream we have the, the she oaks and the reason that they are important, it's not the actual she oaks themselves, uh, it's the uh, needle leaf mistletoe, um, Amiema cambagii. And similarly to the, the box mistletoe, the regent honey eaters uh, feed on uh, the needle leaf mistletoe uh, when, when they're breeding. So they'll also take lerp. Um, so what lerp is, uh, there are uh, insects called leaf psyllids. And when a leaf psyllid is is a, a small insect that they actually build a little like an umbrella really like a, a sugary coating um, to protect themselves and that sugary coating uh, is is yeah well, it's, it's high in high in protein and, and it's it, it's as the name um, suggests it's very sugary so it's a great food source a lot of australian birds really love lerp um, pardalotes uh, in particular uh, are a specialized lerp feeder and, and People might be familiar with with having seen pardalotes uh, constantly getting chased away by honey eaters, and that's because the pardalotes are trying to muscle in on the on the lerp. So regent honey eaters will feed on lerp, um, and, but they'll also occasionally feed on on other nectar sources, such as, well, in particular, calistamins, uh, but also um, uh, grevilleas and um, banksias and, and things like that. So they they breed basically from late winter through to early summer. Um, it's a it's a simple um, cup nest um, bound with spider webs, uh, grass, or even sometimes um, artificial products such as wool. 
um, sat in a, in a fork of a, of a tree, uh, usually a, a, a stringy bark or an iron bark um, type thing, uh, and two or three uh, legs are, eggs are laid. So this is a bird that has suffered a remarkable um, fall from grace in, in recent years. It wasn't that long ago. In fact, I might even flick to, the, to a, a slide here. It wasn't that long ago when we realised that Regent honeyeaters were in decline and we actually started sending people out um, to, not, to count them and to also report them, that we were getting over a thousand birds reported in any given season. Um, but we're now in a situation where the population of the bird, the entire population of the bird is, is only around uh, 300 to 350 individuals. Uh, so yeah, so it's listed as critically endangered under every every legislation there is. And what critically endangered means is that it's the final rung on the ladder before a bird is recognised as extinct in the wild. It's also had a major contraction in range. It's now extinct in South Australia and only really just holding on in Victoria and Queensland. So New South Wales really is the stronghold of Regent honey eaters. Um, just showing that graph there again, just to show the, the severe decline in the bird, things have kind of leveled out a little bit, but we still think the bird is actually still in decline. So why have the Regent honey eaters almost disappeared? Well, the short answer is we don't actually know for sure, but as with just about any threatened species, the loss of habitat is the key driver. Whilst other birds have lost habitat as well, there's something about the Regent honey eater, um, something unique about it that, you know, that is partly or would it partly explain why they have um, suffered such um, severe declines. And really, I think it's it's to do, to do with their, their lifestyle choice. They are what we call a rich patch nomad. They will actually wander the landscape uh, looking for, for, for the best patches. So I guess in a way they're kind of fussy, again, similar to koalas. And, and when you become fussy and you don't generalise, when, when, when you are a specialist um, in an environment, you do run the risk of, of declining. So as we speak, the, the, the most critical threat um, to the Regent honey ant is, is its very, very low population. So normally Regent honey eaters would occur in flocks uh, and they would establish um, sort of breeding aggregations and they would chase other birds away. They would mix it in with the bigger birds and, you know, but uh, these days, because they're, you know, literally in the last few seasons, uh, we've, we've struggled to find, in, in some seasons, we've struggled to find any more than five or six pairs nesting across the entire range of the bird. That's how, that's how serious, serious it is for this species. So you can imagine that when there's just a pair, a pair here and there that they have, all sorts of issues with nest predation um, and competition and things like that. So we're now in a situation where, uh, yeah, we we really are. So in that in that image there, it's it's now really um, they seem to be confined to the periphery of the of the Greater Blue Mountains. So the Lower Hunter, Upper Hunter, Capity, and Burragarang are probably the four main locations uh, where Regent honey eaters now breed. Uh, the Northern Rivers and Northern Tablelands in New South Wales are still recognised as an important area, but they really have declined um, massively in that landscape. And of course, the Central West as well um, is another area where they have declined um, really um, markedly. North East Victoria, they are holding on and some of the captive releases have happened down in Victoria and that is helping keep the Victorian population going. Uh, so back in 1994, uh, the recovery plan was um, enacted and there has been a recovery team um, basically undertaking all the actions that are in the recovery plan since since that time. Uh, so what we're finding uh, in recent years, so Ross Crates from ANU has, has recently done a, a PhD on Regent honey eaters, and what he found in his um, in his data was that this bird is 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 really having a hard time um, breeding. So the nest success is, is, is way down on what, what the birds uh, were recorded doing in the 90s. And even in the 90s, that was quite low. So, so really, um, you know, if, the, if, the, if a critically endangered bird can't breed, then it, yeah, it's, it really, it's all over. We have to be able to facilitate this bird uh, to be able to breed. And the other thing that Ross found, uh, which is a bit alarming, is that there is a, a, a male bias in the population. There, there seems to be a lot of lone 
males wandering through the landscape and at the same time there also appears to be a shortage of, of females so that's a, a real concern. So recently ANU conducted a, what we call a population viability analysis uh, which is a fancy way of, of basically taking all the information we have on Regent honey eaters, churning it out uh, and seeing what were the what would be the, the 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 best ways that we can actually save this bird. Uh, and apart from conserving habitat, uh, which is a no-brainer really, uh, the two things that that they found uh, will actually keep this keep the Regent honey eater from going extinct, uh, increasing the productivity at nests, so protecting nests wherever we can. Uh, so we are at, at a point now that if we do find a pair of Regent honey eaters nesting somewhere that we will actually try and protect that pair to help them get through and, and be successful. And the other uh, action is the release of zoo bred birds, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Uh, so just just a couple of slides on, on nest protection. Uh, mostly that's uh, BirdLife and ANU manage that because BirdLife and ANU we do uh, nearly all of the monitoring uh, for regents and um, LLS do also get involved. Um, you know, in recent years, uh, Greater Sydney LLS discovered a nest down um, in Mulgoa and, um, and monitored that and they, they were successful. Um, but really, when we find a nest, there's not a great deal we can do. Uh, we sometimes put tree collars around the trunks of trees to stop possums and and other arboreal um, predators from getting up the trees uh, because possums and gliders do actually steal um, or they eat the regent honey eater eggs and, and quite often they, they might even kill the, the incubating bird in, in the process. Um, but really that's that's only going to address the mammalian predators. It doesn't address the um, the birds, the avian predators, things like currawongs, kookaburras, ravens, you know, there's any number of, of avian predators that Regent honey eaters have. So uh, there was actually a, a workshop held just a couple of months ago, um, just about everyone involved, you know, at, at the coalface of Regent honey eater conservation, trying to to work out what can we do to get serious about, about, about helping this bird. Uh, and, you know, it was even considered that we, we might actually have to get someone out at a regent honey in a nest to, to shoot any 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 currawongs that come in to try and take off with with the chicks. Uh, that image there is actually taken in the lower hunter uh, when we're doing some noisy minor controls and I'll, I'll talk about noisy minor controls in, in, a, in a minute. So just jumping to the, the captive breeding and release. So we now breed regent honey it is in zoos for two reasons. One is so the, the, the bird doesn't go extinct <laughs> full stop. So we at least have birds in, in captivity. Uh, but moreover, the, the, the most important thing is to supplement the wild population uh, with zoo bred birds every so often. And there are now some some new aviaries in the Central West out at, out at, Dumbo, at a Dubbo at, at Taronga Western Plains. Just a photo there of, of the birds um, out at Dubbo. So until recently, just about all of the releases had happened in, in Chiltern in Victoria, and, and the theory there was that by releasing birds at the edge of the range, we would sort of, sort of, you know, like a like a door, we would ma maintain the population at the edge. But recently, the recovery team decided to uh, release birds into the core of their range, so uh, in in New South Wales. And so far, there's only been two New South Wales releases, um, apart from a very early one back in 2000 in the Capity, um, and both of those have happened in the Hunter Valley. So the Chilton experience has been very positive. So we've had captive pairs breed and successfully um, raise young in the wild. Uh, and even more exciting is that, sorry, I, I should have mentioned that, yeah, even more exciting is that captive birds have bred with wild birds as well. So that's that's it's when you do stuff like this, you're kind of playing God. You don't know if it's going to work, but it, it, so far it seems it seems um, to have worked. Uh, so just jumping to recent releases in New South Wales. So the 2020 release that we did at a place called Quarrelbong was only a very small release of of 20 birds, uh, and that actually the release site is down here somewhere. Um, and it was a, a hell of a task for the guys that were monitoring the birds. They had to cover a lot of ground. Um, because the birds did tend to wander very, very widely. Uh, and it wasn't the most successful release. We know that eight out of the 20 birds um, did actually die um, from the monitoring that we did. 
On the other hand, we conducted a release last year in a place called the Tamalpin Woodlands, south of Curry Curry, just west of Newcastle. Um, that was an, an incredibly successful release. Uh, it's a, a known Regent Honeyeater breeding site. In fact, it's probably the most important single site for Regents in, in, in contemporary times. Uh, and this image here shows a smoking ceremony. Uh, we were welcomed um, by, by the Wanneroo people because we were doing the release on land owned by Minda River Local Aboriginal Land Council. And Uncle Richard here welcomed us uh, to the release site uh, in Wanneroo language. And it's thought that that was the first time that Wanneroo language had been spoken to a group of a gathering of people for over 150 years on that on that country. So it, it's added a, a whole new layer to, to you know, releasing Regent Honey Eaters, um, doing it on Aboriginal owned land. And yeah, so there are actually you know, parallels as well. So the Regent Honey Eater, uh, people might be familiar with uh, the media that, that came out last year. It's the Regent Honey Eater has almost become famous as the bird that lost its song. Uh, and similarly, the, the Wanarua people, uh, they have almost uh, lost their language and they are in the process of reawakening their language. So while we're also working with Taronga and ANU to try and resurrect or, or maintain the song of the bird, we were able to release birds on on, on Wanarua country. And so th these incredible parallels um, happened. And I would actually, I would recommend um, on YouTube, if you go to um, the project, or I can easily send the link through, there's a four and a half minute article um, that featured on, on the project in, in, in March this year, talking about um, last year's captive release. As I said, it was very successful. We only have evidence of just two birds out of 58 birds that were released um, died, uh, which is by far the most successful as far as survival is, is concerned so far. And that's just me monitoring birds from a high point, um, getting signals um, for the, the radio transmitters that, that we that we fit to them. Um, that's the Tamalpan woodlands in there. And these are all records of wild regent honey eaters. And that's curry curry. Uh, yeah, this image here just shows that the birds uh, didn't really move far. Yeah, we had a few wandering birds. Two birds traveled together to visit a, a, a rehabilitated, rehabilitated mine site of all places, but they soon came back. But yeah, it was um, it was very satisfying to see that the birds really just stuck to the patch of bush where we let them go. And uh, very excitingly, we had uh, one successful breeding attempt by two zebra birds. So this is a very precious little chick, uh, and I was still still monitoring um, this guy back in March. Um, I knew where where him and his 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 parents were roosting, and they were actually roosting with wild birds. We had um, evidence of wild birds and and zebra birds roosting together, and we did have a lot of breeding attempts by the zebra birds, but unfortunately. Um, we had a lot of storms last year which destroyed nests but at the same time these are very naive birds these these birds are out in the wild for their first breeding season ever uh, so you don't blame them for building pretty ordinary nests so with experience these these birds um, will get better uh, but it was the first time that we actually had done a release in springtime in the breeding season so it was really really positive to see that the birds just got got stuck into it as soon as they came out of the out of the out of the tents, really. Um, and of course, there were a number of wild birds uh, present in the Tamalpan woodlands while we did um, that release, and we had at least um, seven chick, evidence of seven seven chicks uh, fledged from that. And that's just an another image of of our precious little zoo chick. Um, yeah, so there he is again. Eventually, got on. So at, at the same time. Uh, we we were also watching the wild birds, and I guess this this here uh, is, and I've got some video footage um, of of this. I think this may even be a screen grab, but we went to to check a a, a nest of a wild pair that we were watching um, as the release was happening, and it was, I think it was the day after we found the nest, and we went we went to the nest, looked up, and we couldn't see birds there, but we could hear we could hear a chick begging. Um, and here was a chick just flapping around on the ground. Um, we couldn't find the other chick, so presumably what had happened was that a raven or a currawong had come into the nest, taken off with one of the chicks, and the other chick had fallen out of the nest. 
Uh, so yeah, this is you know a, a really good example of what we're up against. Uh, we we spend a lot of time and money on this bird, and if we can't get them to breed, uh, you know, or I guess another way of putting it is all our work can be undone by one raven or one currawong. So it's it's a it's a real challenge. Uh, so we actually took that bird. Fortunately, Taronga were with us, of course, um, because of the release. And that bird, um, that that chick, because it would have died, um, that chick has gone to Taronga and apparently is doing well. It's a it's a girl. So, yeah, I, I guess a, a, a good ending to that story. No, I'll, I'll just have some of that stuff from yesterday. Yeah, you might have Thanks. to mute whoever that is. <laughs> Maren, Maren, could you mute your microphone, please, so we don't hear a conversation? Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to run through some of the other um, recovery actions that we do just 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 quickly. Um, the captive release is probably the, the biggest thing that we that we we do really. So uh, one of the other things we do is covenanting. So because most Regent Honey records actually have come in recent years have come from private properties, working with private landholders is is really important. So. When we talk about covenanting, that's actually um, securing um, or conserving land in perpetuity on on, on private properties, um, and that's happened in a in a number of landscapes. This this image or these images here are from are from the uh, the Capity Valley, uh, and you know we've actually managed to to put covenants on properties where Regent Honey it is have actually since since bred, uh, which is really exciting, and of course habitat. Um, restoration has occurred. Uh, there's a good image there of some pretty major um, um, large-scale restoration in, in northeast uh, Victoria. Uh, and you know, David mentioned that there's been some habitat restoration occur in the central west as well. Uh, and all that work, I guess, is that's a that's a, a future. That's a long-term investment. Things like the captive releases that that we do are, are very short-term uh, because Regent Honey it is may not have enough time um, to use those tree plantings. We need to get this species through that bottleneck so that they can then use the, the tree planting that we do today. So I'm going to talk about mistletoe uh, for a few slides. Mistletoe has become a bit of an obsession of mine because it's such a fascinating plant. Um, here's a couple of images of little lorikeets, which are usually feeding on gum tree blossom, uh, feeding in both needle leaf um, and long flower mistletoe in that photo. It's also extremely important for, for Regent honey eaters. Uh, so that, again, there's three different species of mistletoe being used by, by Regents, and they also use the mistletoe when they're breeding. Uh, and last year, at a place in the Upper Hunter, along the Merry War River, we actually had four, four nests, four Regent honey eater nests, four separate pairs, uh, nesting in about 300 metres of, of river frontage in um, in, in the she oaks, but they were feeding on, on the mistletoe. Uh, very important. Uh, and so that photo there is a bird sitting in a long flowered mistletoe in the Lower Hunter woodlands, um, in the Tamapan woodlands in the Lower Hunter. So one of the key threats to that area is actually bushfires. So this red polygon shows some very severe fires that have occurred in the last five or six years. And the yellow dots are Regent Honey at a record. You, you can see that the fires have overlapped um, with those with the Regent Honey Eater um, habitat. Uh, this image here just shows the severity of the fires. They, they were hot canopy fires, um, and there's a bird sitting in a mistletoe in 2018 uh, in an area that, that didn't burn. Uh, but what happens with mistletoe is when it when it is burnt, it is killed outright. Whereas gum trees come back after fire, mistletoe is just dead. So when Mistletoe dis disappears from a landscape when you when you get a canopy fire going through a forest. Um, it would take a very long time for the mistletoe to return because we need mistletoe birds and other things that eat the mistletoe um, and deposit the seeds on on the branches. It, it, it would take literally, I think, twenty to thirty years before this forest would recover and the mistletoe would return. So we thought we'd get ahead of the game. Uh, you know, take take the mistletoe bird's job out of his hands and actually pick the mistletoe ourselves uh, and and plant them up into the canopy of of these uh, spotted gum trees. You, anyone can do this. Yeah, you can actually just pick mistletoe and, and plant it low down. But we, as was shown in that last slide, we actually engaged professional arborists to get the 
the seeds up into the canopy because regent honey eaters won't use or they certainly wouldn't nest in a mistletoe clump that is very low down. So we needed to, to get the, the um, mistletoe into the canopy. Um, and there's an arborist there. And I, yeah, you can just make out an arborist there right at the top of that, that, that spot of gum. And so far over the course of a couple of seasons, we've managed to plant 2000 seeds. Uh, and again, that work's been taking place on land owned by Minda River um, Aboriginal Land Council. Mistletoe also doesn't survive drought very well um, in the Capity Valley uh, along the Capity River, which was at one time the nursery ground for the Regent honey eater. Um, just about every single mistletoe clump died during the drought. Uh, so we've also been out planting mistletoe seeds into the River She Oaks in the Capity Valley. Uh, so, you know, this is really a really novel approach to habitat restoration. Uh, when we think about re-veg, we think about planting trees, but you know, we're sort of thinking outside of the box and actually planting mistletoe. Uh, one of the other things that we do is remove noisy miners from Regent Honey at a uh, breeding sites. I think it's no secret that um, noisy miners are actually a major problem for woodland birds. Uh, they will drive other birds away and of course they have proliferated across the, the landscape. They are now artificially common uh, or abundant. Um, so they are actually a major problem and they, they, they will occupy places where Regent Honey Eaters will try to breed. Um, and they are listed as a key threatening process um, at just about every, every level. So the science is in, nausea miners are a problem. So what do we do? Uh, well, it's more broadly, it's a very difficult issue to tackle, but for regents, uh, we go in and we actually remove nausea miners from the breeding sites by, by shooting them. Uh, and it's done both proactively and reactively. So proactively is going in before a breeding season to remove birds and reactively is, um, for example, in 2017, Ross found some regent honey eaters trying to breed in bogey TSR in the Capity Valley. And he gave us a call and said, guys, we've got some uh, noisy miners giving the regent honey eaters a hard time. What can you do? So we, we went in and we removed those miners and that was actually the most successful site for regents in, in that particular season. So this is really important work. Um, that we're doing to, to, to help regents um, you know, breed successfully. An exciting opportunity came along during the captive release. So the technology is such now that we can actually put satellite tags, satellite transmitters on a bird as small as a regent honey eater. Um, normally this has been in the domain of, of larger birds such as shorebirds and, and seabirds, uh, but there are some transmitters that are small enough uh, to, to be fitted to a large male regent honey eater. So in December and, and then again in February, we were able to actually capture three Regent honey eaters. Uh, we, they were all ex zoo bred birds. We did actually catch a couple of wild birds as well, but the wild birds weren't, unfortunately weren't heavy enough to, to take the satellite transmitters. So there's a photo of a very proud Dean Ingwison, who's the recovery coordinator for Regent honey eaters uh, with uh, a Regent wearing a satellite transmitter. Um, Unfortunately, we haven't had a lot of data from those transmitters um, in the meantime, but, but we're, we are working on that. So how you can help, first of all, by reporting all sightings. That's a, a very, uh, very important thing that, that the public can do, and we really need to know about any Regent Honey to record in real time. So I'm going to finish the talk, uh, just glancing at the time, by talking about how to recognise and identify Regents. Uh, I like to think that they're, they're reasonably distinct. Um, they've got this beautiful black and gold plumage, um, fully black head with that, that sort of warty bare skin around the eye, beautiful black tail with um, some black and, and yellow tail, um, completely yellow underneath. A uh, bit smaller than a noisy miner. So they are actually, the, the, the species that we get uh, reported to us that are most often confused with a regent honey eater are things like the New Holland honey eater. So these, there are a number of small honey eaters in Australia that are roughly the size of a sparrow. Uh, then you've got a noisy miner. Regents are somewhere in between. Uh, they're what we call a medium sized honey eater. So they're a bit bigger than um, say yellow faced or another small honey eater that people might be fam familiar with, but a bit smaller than a, than a noisy miner. We've got a number of identification guides available online and I'm pretty sure that you guys 
uh, at Central West would have uh, printed copies at your offices that you could get to anyone who's interested. So just quickly finishing with um, tips on finding Regent honey eaters. First of all, of course, you've got to go to the, to the right habitat. So we spoke about the grassy white box and the box ironbark uh, woodlands before. Uh, then it's 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 all about finding blossom. Generally speaking, if you go to a forest and there's no eucalypt blossom, you've got very little chance of, of finding Regent honey. It is because they're probably elsewhere in a different part of the country where there's blossom. Uh, then what I, I, I tend to do is I, I listen for uh, your birds that are in, indicative of, of a really good um, blossom event or, or, or nectar yield. So things like little lorikeets or noisy firebirds. So if, if you're out and about and you're hearing that sound or hearing lots of little lorikeets, the chances are there's, there's blossom around. So continue on, on your way and you, you, you're always looking for, for, for things like white-naped honey. There's things that Regent honey eaters tend to... to uh, and what I do is once I once I find a tree that's got good blossom, uh, particularly large trees, I I like to try and work out the demographics of that blossoming tree. So I just get my eye in for what's happening in that tree. And often you'll have the larger honey eaters at the top and they're quite aggressive and you'll have all the small honey eaters darting around trying to get at the blossom and the, the, the larger honey eaters will, will, will chase the smaller ones away. What you're looking for is a, 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 a honey eater that's sort of between the sizes of those, um, of those honey eaters uh, and yeah. There's not, there's not many honey eaters that actually are the size of a regent. So if you see a medium sized honey eater, you, 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 could, be, you could be in luck. Um, they're also quite attracted to, to water sources, particularly in the afternoon. Um, as with any forest bird, uh, the most important thing probably isn't recognising what they look like, but recognising what they sound like. So I'm just going to play the call of a regent honey eater here. So it's a bit of a soft chuckle call um, inside the like, classic trait of a regent honey is that it claps its bill excitedly. Um, uh, just be patient, um, stick around. You may not, if there's a regent honey around, it may not be obvious for the first few minutes. Uh, and we do say to people, look, if you, if you think it's worthwhile, by all means, play a call to see if you can bring a bird in, uh, but just don't do that if you suspect they might be breeding or if, you, you know, if you're near a busy road or something where you might be endangering the bird. So I'll leave it there with only seven minutes to spare um, for, for questions. So yeah, thanks everyone for, for listening. Thank you, Mick. That was really, really interesting. I'm really excited to um, to get out and see what I can hear. Um, so we might start off, there has been a question from Rosemary who has asked how long until the noisy miners return to areas where they have been removed and she's also asked what is their migration pattern? Do they come to New South Wales from Victoria? Yeah okay so I'll start with the, the second question uh, which is a really good one. We We've got a reasonable idea um, that, well, we, we know that regent honeys will, will move long distances. In fact, we have had uh, banded birds uh, arrive 600 kilometres from where they were banded. Uh, but what we, what we don't know is if there's any sort of regular pattern to it. Uh, we're reasonably confident that they, they, they wander. They, they are constantly looking for the best patches of, of blossom. And I think that that is actually a factor that has contributed to, to their decline is the fact that because we've lost so much habitat, all of these corridors and all, all the areas where they used to travel through looking for the best patches are effectively gone. Uh, so because they don't have a um, like a dedicated north, south, east, west movement, um, yeah, that's potentially um, been to their un undoing. But yes, they, they definitely do move between, um, between areas. In fact, they, they rarely stay in the one spot for, for, for very long. And on the noisy miner thing, uh, it actually depends on the landscape that you're doing the removal. So uh, what we found is uh, that in, in 
fragmented landscapes such as the Capity Valley, where we've been doing noisy miner removal for, for quite some time. Miners do return reasonably quickly back to that that area because when you think about it, it doesn't take long for, for the noisy miners on, on the periphery of where you've done your removals. They will just slow, slowly move back in. Uh, and, you know, other institutions have done research on this and they've actually found that, that the miners can be back within a few days. Uh, so we're actually quite strategic about, about where we do our miner removal. And Ross at ANU has done quite a bit of research on that. And not surprisingly, we've found that it's, it's those linear patches such as uh, places like the Widden Valley, where it's, a, it's, it's a, a creek line hemmed in by sandstone. And once you remove those miners from that corridor, there's not much opportunity for miners to move back in because they don't occupy the, the sandstone country. So it's a very big uh, task to try and remove miners. But I guess each season when we're doing it, we're, we're giving whatever pairs arrive at a site, we're giving them a, a, a bit of a head start, I suppose. And Mick, Libby has asked, are Indian miners a problem also for Regents? No, no. So Indian miners really don't, well, at present anyway, they don't really intersect with with Regent honey eaters. They they are probably in some landscapes as the miners are actually marching further west. They they might actually be occupying the same environments, but they they have completely different um, habitat um, niches, and it's it's more that the it's more the nectar feeding birds, and and also because the miners don't build you know. The, Common miners or Indian miners don't build a stick nest like a region. Their their ecology is is quite different. So yeah, it's it's really the the native uh, noisy miner that that is the problem. And yeah, it's I do do feel sorry for the noisy miner because it's not its fault. It's it's our fault. We we have created the perfect environment for noisy miners to explode basically. But but now that they're a problem, we just need to do something about it. Yeah, fair enough. And uh, Linda has asked, well, she's said that she has mistletoe. She's in the central tablelands and she's asked, when is the best time to harvest? Great question. Um, this is, yeah, we're, we're really trying to, to increase the, the awareness of mistletoe and at the same time dispel myths that mistletoes um, kill trees because because they, they don't. I mean, they will, but only when a tree is already highly stressed. So. Uh, thinking about actually um, planting mistletoes, uh, it's st something that we're still in the early days of of doing. Uh, we've only been planting for um, three seasons, uh, but what, what we have found with the mistletoe down around Cessnock is that you've got a reasonably short short window um, for two reasons. One, because the the fruit itself uh, will, will will drop and it's only sort of viable for a short period. You do what I call, um, or what others call, the, the avocado test. Just get a bit of a squeeze. If it's nice and soft, um, then it's then then it's ready. Yeah, different mistletoes, um, um, you know, would have different. You know, you, you're about to tell um, different ways whether or not the outside, whether the fruity section is soft. I'm not sure, but for the long flowered mistletoe, at least, you just got to test to see how hard it is. The other reason is that uh, we find that. Uh, birds and things take off with our fruit. So, you know, mistletoe birds are, are, are out there busily um, gobbling them down. So uh, for the box mistletoe out, out your way, which would be, and the noodle leaf mistletoe, both of those would be fruiting uh, sort of late spring, I guess. Well, the, the, the noodle leaf will be late spring, but the box mistletoe, because it flowers over summer, it would be fruiting around March, April. So yeah, I'd, I'd be looking out for, for mistletoe fruit any time from about, say, November through to, to, to February, depending on the mistletoe that you have. Excellent. Thank you, Mick. Now, we don't have a lot of time left. Libby has just asked another question, and I think that we also have um, another quick survey, if possible. Um, but she has just oh. asked, do you leave the mistletoe seed to dry or do you squeeze it and then locate onto other trees? Really, really good question. Um, because you 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 simply cannot store mistletoe seeds. It's it's almost it's almost a matter of picking it and planting it. Uh, David Watson has told us that you can store them in the fridge for a couple of weeks or whatever, but we haven't had much luck with that. So yeah, so don't don't try and dry them out. Don't prepare them. 
as soon as you, you pick a fruit and you can squeeze it out, it's ready. And and it's so easy because it is so sticky that you'll actually have to scrape the thing off your finger when you wipe it on the underside of a branch. So it's actually something that kids, you know, I've had my kids out doing it with me. They they love it. It's a it's a novelty. It's 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 good fun. So yeah. Great. And so now, Libby, would you like to jump on and do your um, survey post webinar? Sure. I'm just going to quickly ask Mick one more question, if that's if that's allowed. Uh, Jackie is um, so cooler is one of the sort of more important areas around um, the Central West for um, potentially region honey eater habitat, and there's lots of wind farms that are going in there. So. Are regions affected? Do they fly that high? I mean, some of these turbines are really, really tall and really wide now. Is that going to make an impact, you think, or? Probably not. I mean, okay. that, the, the landscape, the landscapes where wind farms are establishing aren't really those that, that Regent and Honey would use now, now that there's so few of them. A hundred years ago, if we were doing this, you know, I would have maybe said, yeah, mate, yeah, yes, but, but, these days, they're probably less likely to to move through those really high, highly fragmented landscapes where these yeah. winds are going. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. No, look, that's 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 really good. Um, I hadn't even really considered that. They're not going to be putting wind farms down gullies and and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. Right? No, that's yeah. great. And, and, and in wooded areas. Yeah. 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 Well, um, look, and thanks, Mick. It's been um, it's it's been fascinating. Now I'm just going to do this very quick post webinar um, survey questions for everyone. So if you can just go back into the chat, please. Um, the questions uh, are very similar, and if you could just put up now um, post at the top of your chat. And question one is, how confident are you now of being able to identify the Regent honey eater by its call uh, or feeding habitat and markings? So um, it's a beautiful call. It's absolutely gorgeous. I did I did have to rush through that last bit. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I should mention that the call is available on, on our website. So if you navigate to uh, if you just Google Regent Honey Eater Bird Life, you'll find our Woodland Birds website and there is actually an MP3 uh, file there that you can play the call. Fantastic. Thanks, Mick. So j just for that question one, uh, we're on the same parameters. One, you strongly disagree. Five, you strongly agree that you feel more confident now after the webinar that you could um, identify a Regent Honey Eater if you're very lucky enough to see one in the wild. Um, <laughs> question two. How well now do you understand the threats that are causing the decline in the numbers of Regent honey eaters? Again, the same parameters, one to five. Put that into the chat for us. That would be fabulous. And question three, how confident are you in understanding what management actions might be achievable to help slow the decline in regions. So Mick's mentioned a couple of those with mistletoe. Now Mick, I just wanted to ask, do you send your children up to the tops of canopies in trees to, to stick the, the mistletoe underside? Uh, so that's just, quick. I, I just realised I was muted. Um, no, yes. uh, not, not yet. They're only nine and six, but give them a couple of years. Okay. And, uh, but they're, they, they, they love um, collecting them because um, funnily enough, there's actually some rest areas here on the Hunter Expressway that have spotted gums and somehow there's a lot of low down um, mistletoe and the kids love just walking around the car park and picking the fruits. Picking yeah. The fruits. Yeah, yeah. It's not often you see a lot of low hanging mistletoe. It's often, you know, quite a bit high, which which That's obviously right. is a is an issue. Yeah. So hopefully, um, Linda, when you're when you're doing your mistletoe um, distribution that you're not climbing to the tops of trees. <laughs> and question four, uh, then we'll finish, is um, uh, having listened to the webinar today, will you look at making any changes to um, either the management that you might do on farm and in particular about the importance of mistletoe, which is just critical for so many birds, but particularly the Regent honey eater. So again, um, would you look at making any changes now with the knowledge that uh, that you have received today or be happy to you know, talk to other people about it as well? Uh, and again, the same um, parameters. And if just you can just put those are, in the chat and post those. Yep. I was just going to say, Libby, just just while people are answering that, um, mm. it's worth you guys knowing that we actually have dedicated talks uh, to to the whole mistletoe thing 
Uh, and I think as we speak, there's been a media release uh, go out from from Northwest, and yeah, so we are getting on the front foot with with this whole mistletoe story. And you know, I did like it was only a very small part of my talk then, uh, but it'd be great one day uh, one of us can come back and and give you guys a, a talk about about mistletoe and yeah, give give more context to about it. I, I agree, uh, Mick. I think it's really important. And I was lucky enough to go to one of David Welsh's Welsh Welsh Welsh's um, Watson. Oh, Watson. Sorry. Whoops. That's a bit bad. Um, <laughs> uh, talks in Merry War about um, you know uh, last year, and it was fascinating. I had no no idea. So I, and I'm I'm sprouting that whenever I go and see landholders and let them know how important mistletoe is for uh, all sorts of birds, particularly regions. Yeah. Um, Jackie, did you want to come back on and just um, finish things off for us? Yep, absolutely. I just want to thank everybody so much for taking your time uh, on your Friday uh, to sit in and listen with us. Um, and to Mick, thank you so much. We really do appreciate your expertise and your knowledge um, and sharing with us all that you know. I think that if anybody has any questions um, following this webinar, if anything occurs to you, please reach out to David. You should all have his email address. He sent you the registration link for the webinar. Um, and unless anyone has anything else to say, we might finish up for the day.